the only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. This is what God has to say about pride and of nations and individuals are lifted up with pride. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. Pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. And though they join hand in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Ezekiel named four reasons why God destroyed Sodom with fire and brimstone. He named very clearly prosperity, wallowing idly in luxury, the neglect of the poor and needy. But first and foremost, the prophet warned, he brought Sodom down because of its pride. This was the iniquity of Sodom, and it begins with pride. This is the reason God said, I destroyed that society because of its pride. Homosexuality isn't even named. Inhospitality isn't named. Drunkenness, gambling, adultery, idolatry, not even named. Because the root sin of all of these sins is pride. It, all of our sins emanate from this root cause of pride. What is it that brings calamity down upon nations? And the answer has been trumpeted all through the word of God. It's pride that goes before destruction. God has warned many nations before they fell what he was going to do because of their pride. God warned the nation of Israel just before he judged Israel. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And upon every high tower and every fenced wall, the loftiness of man shall be brought bowed down. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And the greatest power in all of earth at that time, Babylon. Babylon, that great society, that wicked society, that prosperous society with great armies. God said, call together the archers against Babylon. Recompense her according to her works. For she had been proud against the Lord and against the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I'm against thee, O thou most proud, saith the Lord of hosts. For the day has come, the time when I will visit thee, and the most proud shall stumble and fall, and none shall raise her up. And I'll kindle fire in all her cities, and it shall devour all around about him. You see, Ezekiel the prophet equates pride with utter rejection of dependence and trust in the Lord, and turning to confidence in flesh and human ability. He said, that's pride. You won't acknowledge me as being the one who delivers. You won't acknowledge me. You trust in what you have, your armament. You trust in your pride. You trust in your ability to accomplish it. And you turn aside from acknowledging my power, my strength. You see, uh, any proud nation, whether it's the United States or any nation on earth, that nation says we don't need or want God in our education system. We don't want Him mentioned in our courts. We don't need or want Him, His commandments posted in any of our public buildings. We don't want His name anymore even in our history books. No public praying to Him and never mention the name of Christ. A proud nation declares who needs God to fight our battles. Proud nations say we are superpowers. Pride of a nation comes when they scoff at prophets and watchmen who warn of coming judgments. Pride refuses to believe there's a God in heaven who will smite with anger those who turn against him. We become arrogant and boastful in our own might and we diminish the power of God. And most tragic of all, pride of nations comes at that time when we ignore all the warnings of history and how God has dealt with past nations who reached the flash points of judgment. Totally ignore history. And this was the indictment of the prophet Ezekiel against Judah. He said, you have patterns, you have illustrations on the right hand and on the left regarding Sodom. Even in Ezekiel's time, that was the epitome of evil. The word was barely mentioned because it represented everything that's evil and corrupt even in this time. You know the story when God could no longer endure the evil. He could no longer endure the corruption of Sodom. And he sent fire and brimstone from heaven in one day. Destroyed a proud, prosperous people at ease, eating, drinking, indulging in every kind of sexual promiscuity. In one day it was all over. God allowed them to be carried away. And I am so shocked and grieved to hear preachers say this was the work of the devil. It wasn't the devil that sent fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. It wasn't the devil that sent a flood and saved only eight people. It wasn't the devil. It was a God who said, your sins have reached into heaven and I can't handle it anymore. 
Ezekiel's word to Judah has horrible, tragic implications for the United States of America because America has become the sister of Sodom. No other nation in history of mankind has been so blessed and prospered. No other nation on earth has had so much truth and gospel light shed upon it. Sodom had no Bible, no prophets. America has been inundated with the gospel. Bibles, books, videos, tapes, pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets and watchmen across the land warning, pleading for repentance. There's hardly a home or community in the United States that hasn't had a clear message of the gospel and pleading from the Holy Spirit. Christian voices calling a nation to repentance. You see, Nineveh repented the preaching of one prophet and we have mocked hundreds and thousands of watchmen and prophets. Sodom's great sin that precipitated judgment, I said, was pride. But you see, I want to talk to you about a kind of pride that Sodom could not possibly have been guilty of, nor Samaria. It's a sin that can only be, a sin of pride that can only be committed by those living in the last days, meaning us. It was not a sin against greater light. It's a sin against him who says he is the light. Let me show you the epitome of pride, the kind of pride that is bringing calamity upon our nation. Folks, it's not national pride. It's not flying the American flag. You see, God didn't send his son to Sodom. They didn't have a gospel. They didn't have a redeemer. You see, God sent his son to the last days. And now we're winding up the last days, the last of the last days. And you see, God sent his only son to us. He sent him as a redeemer. He sent him to break every chain, to set every prisoner free. That means everybody bound by homosexuality, drug addiction, alcoholism, gambling, well, fornication, adultery, whatever it may be. He sent a redeemer. He made an offer to the world. He said in the last days before it all winds up, I give you this offer of freedom. I, if you would just simply trust in me, if you would give me your heart, if you'll call upon me, I will deliver all your enemies in your hand. No weapon formed against you shall ever prosper. I'll put a wall around you that no man can touch. And I'll be the glory therein. And I'll deliver you from the power of lust. I'll deliver you from the slavery of sin. He came. God came to this world in flesh. He sent his only son. And you see when here is the pride of this nation. And not just this nation, but many nations in the world now. When this offer is made. And we go to the world with this offer, saying to every man bound by the power of sin and the devil and hell. And we say to you, you can be free. Jesus paid the price. He conquered sin and death for you and me. And he gives you this free offer. And all he asks of you is that you believe that, that you trust him and give your life completed to him and let his spirit li live in you. And he will enable you to live in peace and victory and an incredible offer is given to the world and we thumb our nose at it and we say we don't need you and now man turns in pride and worships the creature more than the creator worships men's bodies and women's bodies and turn from this offer that Jesus Christ has made, God has made through his own son to the whole world and especially to America we've had more gospel than all the nations combined and if, instead of accepting his mercy even our leaders seek to cast them out of our society. Folks, that is blasphemous pride. And suddenly calamity strikes and suddenly God is popular. Even agnostics are singing, God bless America. Agnostics who have been voting him out of our schools, voting him out of our public places, and now trying to get him out of American history. Now they sing, stand beside us. God lead us. God guide us. It's hypocrisy. The worst kind. That's not what moves God. God's saying, what are you going to do about my son? I gave my son. He died. What about my son? What about Jesus Christ? Today, only a righteous remnant revere his name. Oh, folks, politicians, businessmen up and down the streets. You hear it on the job. What do you hear about Jesus Christ but cursing? Folks, there's a Niagara. Can you imagine what hits the ears of God, what ascends to the ears of God? A Niagara of cursing of his own son that he gave out of his own love. You talk about God not judging sin. He allowed the sin of the whole world to come on his own son, the most innocent of all. You can't tell me that a nation that makes it unconstitutional to utter his name in schools and public buildings in the name of separation churches that you can't tell me God won't judge that. Now, I want you to listen very closely to what I'm about to say now. I want you to think of two words 
And if you think of these two words, you'll understand what's going on in the United States and the world now. Because what we've seen is only the beginning. And you'll understand what's happening. Think Christ and Antichrist. Two words. And if you begin to see that this is a spiritual war, this began when Jesus was born. This war started. And it won't end till Armageddon. When God gathers all the armies of the world to one place, and God the Father brings them all under control, destroys all the armies of the world, and makes them a footstool of Jesus Christ, His own Son. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh it is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you've heard that it shall come, and even now is in the world. He said, I'm going to tell you what the spirit of Antichrist is, Paul said. It's a religious movement, but any religion that says Jesus Christ was not God in flesh, Jesus Christ is not divine, Jesus Christ is not resurrected, Jesus Christ is not in the heavens, he will not rule the earth, Jesus was a man, a prophet, and that's it. Little children, it's the last time, and you've heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists whereby we know it's the last time. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. He said, that's Antichrist. That's what the war is all about. That's what Antichrist is about. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver. This is Antichrist. There's an Antichrist spirit that's been in the world, but now it's let loose in all its full fury because we've entered now the last chapter of the last days. Paul said there's going to be a great falling away, and we've witnessed that, and we'll witness it more. But in that hour, that man of sin shall be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. Folks, this is a battle that's spiritual in nature, and it's going to continue. If you're expecting a war to end in one year, two years, three years is not going to end. We may withdraw from the battle. We may call our armies home and it may look like peace, but it's not going to be peace because this war has been fully declared now. What are we to do as a church? What are we to do as God's people? Two words, wake up. I believe God's greatest anger is against his backslidden church. Now he's going to judge his house because that's where judgment begins. The Bible makes it clear when he's tried everything else and he even send wake up calls. Wake up call first prosperity, then he warns, he warns first of all, he baptizes with prosperity. This is the pattern in history, S sends warnings, wake up calls, and these wake up calls get increasingly more severe. And then finally, the last thing God does, he did it all through the word of God, and he did it to Judah. He said, I'm going to take away your staff of bread. And that is the economy. And folks, the day is not far off when the thousand fires I saw burning in New York and what you heard of the curse of Babylon, fires in all your cities. In the church of Jesus Christ, we've received the wake up call. God's saying, get serious now. I'm not going to say, go sell your TV. But I'm telling you, if you don't have the courage at least to shut off the foolishness and the vileness, if you don't have that courage, you're going to be sitting there in ease in Zion the very time you should be on your face before Almighty God praying for your family, praying for the country, you're going to be satiated in your mind with such foolishness and such childishness, such filth. Oh, glory be to God. Our captain died for us. The captain of our salvation. One man died. And in that one death, he conquered all the religions of the world. He conquered it. All the powers of hell. I don't have to die for Jesus. He died for me. He died for the whole world. I've entered into his death by faith. Oh, there'll be martyrs. There'll be those who pay their, their life. But folks, there'll be no merit in any man's death. Doesn't merit anything. He said, if you give your body to birth the stake and don't have charity, it amounts to nothing. Folks, we have got to understand clearly now and get it deep into your heart. Hallelujah. Those who follow Jesus Christ are the only ones who have a resurrected leader. Mohammed's dead. He's in the grave. All the world's religious leaders are dust. But ours, our leader, dead, resurrected, in glory. King of kings and Lord of lords. He already won the war. We know how it ends. And 
That's why I said, my children, when you see all these things begin to happen, look up because your redemption draws nigh. Hallelujah. The Bible said one day soon, when the tribulation begins, there's only seven years of the Antichrist reign, seven short years, and then the Lord's going to gather them in the battlefields of Armageddon. And folks, that's the Mideast. And he says he's going to rain fire down upon them and destroy them all. And he said, and folks, I believe he's mounting his white horse even now. And he said he's coming with his armies. He said, and every eye shall behold him, every knee shall bow before him. All the world's leaders will bow before him. The Bible says he's going to come and they will all call him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So folks, we have nothing to fear. Live or die, we're the Lord's. We are his. Folks, it's going to be very exciting. Some of you worried about your jobs, worried about your family, no need to. He who gave you sight, he who created you out of the dust of the earth he created. If he can do that, can he keep us? Will he not keep his children that love him? Lord, we can talk about the sins of the nation. We can talk about the sins of those in Congress. We can talk about them removing God out of society and making him politically incorrect. But, oh God, you're looking deeper than that. You're looking into my heart and the hearts of all the people hearing me now and saying, what have you done with my Christ? Where do you stand with my Christ? Do you believe he's God in flesh? Do you believe he's the savior of the world? If you believe that, then why haven't you surrendered all to him? Why would you allow pride to destroy you? Each time God chastens lovingly and he does it to get our attention. All judgments of God are remedial in purpose to remedy a situation to bring a people back to his heart. Lest he lose a whole nation. And he does it out of love. When the Lord loves, he chastens. So if you don't respond to his love and his wake-up calls and his chastenings, chances are you never will. And you'll harden your heart. And I beg you in the name of the Lord and his mercy. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.